I'm here today with Lion Polk, who is a managing director in Morgan Stanley's Wealth Management Group and runs Polk Wealth Management. And Lion, cannot thank you enough for your time today. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, before we begin, let's talk a little bit about what your life was like growing up as a kid. Well, I grew up in, uh, in Brookville and went to a school in Locust Valley, Portledge, uh, which my father was very involved in. And, um, and actually, when we got there, uh, the school only went to the sixth grade, and he got very involved in, and grew the school to uh, all the way through upper school. So I went, I went to school all the way through at Portledge. Sp uh, spent my time playing a lot of sports, okay. ice hockey, soccer, um, and uh, and then went off to Hartwood College. So, Lyon, your family uh, came to this country obviously a long, long time ago, and they've been very involved with uh, the political system in many different ways. Tell us a little bit about that. So, um, yeah, on my father's side, I have Polk, and on my mother's side, I have Buchanan. And uh, it, it, was, it was interesting. So Polk was always known as one of the best presidents because he got in the Texas-Mexican War and got everything west of the Mississippi. Buchanan was known as one of the worst because he was the president right before Lincoln. Um, but, uh, and then uh, um, uh, Lion Polk III, Lion Polk I was Under Secretary of State for Wilson and was uh, one of the architects for the Versailles Treaty. And when he came back to New York, then he started Davis Polk, okay. the uh, big law firm. So, but it's it's interesting because at home, my mother is a very big Democrat. My father was always a staunch Republican, and so anytime around elections, it was always uh, very interesting around the house. Now, are you gonna are you gonna follow the tradition and, and do something in politics, or is that not even Absolutely an option? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a smart man. Yeah, to, in, in, in today's world, you know, we understand it for what our what our business is, but I wouldn't want to be in that field. And how did you? Uh, decide to go into finance? I think your father was in the insurance industry. Right. How did you get into the money management area? Well, so I was always interested in stocks, and so I was able to get a job at a brokerage firm in the mid-80s, but most of the time back then it was mostly about picking individual stocks and not about investment advisory, mm -hmm. which is what the business has really transitioned into today. Right now, you've got an incredibly successful business. Uh, you've, got, you've created an amazing platform within Morgan Stanley. How have you made it happen? The core is obviously investment management, balance sheet management, personal banking, investment banking, all of that. So I was able to put together a team back then where each member of the team focused on one of those particular areas rather than having one person trying to do all of those things. Okay. Which is really, if you think about the industry back then, is where you had a broker trying to do pick stocks, um, you know, do lending if they were doing any lending at all. And, and so I, I thought a holistic approach would be a really interesting way to establish that business. And when you're dealing with these high net worth uh, families, I mean, every family is different. Every family has their own issues. And you guys are providing services to really help them not only to address money management or their finances, but also address other things. Tell us a little bit about that. The business has obviously evolved over the years. And what really changed for us was in 2007, 2008, um, two things happened. Obviously, the financial crisis made a lot of the really wealthy people realize they need people that spend 100% of the time looking after their investments rather than trying to do some of it themselves. The second thing that was already happening from the beginning of the, of the decade was that um, family offices were really uh, coming on. And by the you know, late 2000s, um, people who had built family offices were really looking at the cost of it and were they really getting what they wanted for what they were spending. Uh, whether they, Should they hire an in-source CIO or should they outsource the CIO, uh, CIO function? What things inside the family office should they do internally and what should they do externally? What about, um, you know, how does it make you feel to have been uh, elected by Barron's, I guess, for the past, what, seven or eight years as one of the top money managers, uh, you know, in the country and around the world? Well, it's obviously great to be recognized by Barron's, and um, you know one of the greatest things about Barron's is going down to these conferences and meeting all my peers who are obviously have successful businesses. And in our business, there's no one model that's better than the others. There's many different ways to do this, and to be able to um, you know have a relationship with my counterparts at, at Merrill Lynch or UBS and talk to them and us learn from each other has really been incredibly valuable. I would say that um, when we're presenting to a new client, having 
Barron's on the Barron's list, it's like the good housekeeping seal of approval. Mm -hmm. So it's a great third party validation, even if we're being referred in by a client, for them to see that we've, uh, um, we're, that we're on the Barron's list and have been recognized by Barron's because sure. they obviously do a lot of work uh, scrubbing you know, who's on that list. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, one of your primary philosophies uh, is based around your motto, all things to some people. You've, you've stuck with that for a long time. I know, yes. know you have. Tell us a little bit about that. So again, it's, you know, as I mentioned before, where some people are just focused on investments, we find that most people have, you know, there are many things they care about, investments being one of them, but it's having their family life run well. It's, you know, not messing up the kids, not having wealth mess up the kids. Obviously, when you and I were growing up, you really couldn't tell other than by what kind of car someone drove or house they lived in, how much wealth their family has. Now you can Google somebody and figure out, you know, their kids can really figure out kind of what the money looks like. And so it is a, I, I think that in the last, you know, I would say pre-07, it was how can you make me the most amount of money? Then it was like, don't, how can I sit, preserve my capital? And the number one thing we hear from clients today is how, how do I not mess up my kids? How do I not let my money mess up my kids? Yeah. And so that has been, a, uh, th that has been a, 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 an interesting topic. So when we have our team, we have people that uh, specialize in all these different areas. And I have one member of my team who, who really focuses on family dynamics. How do you guys deal with um, you know, market volatility you know, uh, in terms of the crash of 2008? What did you tell your clients during that time? Well, so you know, we always say to folks when they come to us, they're already wealthy. So our first objective is to make sure they stay that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but then you know, on my investment team, I have uh, six people that are on my investment team as well as having Morgan Stanley here supporting what we do. So we have the Global Investment Committee that talks about um, you know, things that are going in the market and make their recommendations. But we as a team uh, also have our particular way we invest and our overlays. And so what has really helped us the most, I would say, in 2000 and 2007 is understanding technical analysis a lot. So as the market started to roll over, we knew that it was time to be cutting exposure to risk assets, uh, which I think is something that's very similar that's going to happen um, you know, today. I mean, the market's been in an incredible run. And, uh, you know, you could look at the S&P and say that it's fairly valued. It's not overvalued. It's, it's fairly valued. But at some point, it'll st you know, when it starts to break, then we're going to be cutting, uh, cutting risk assets. Well, it's interesting that you say that because you look at, you know, everybody's got their view. And we interviewed Leon Cooperman uh, a few weeks back, and his comment was, I think this could be a really incredible run going forward. Yep. Um, and uh, yet we're sitting here in a, a period where everybody's still licking their wounds from 2008. That's right. Um, do you think that, that, well, first of all, if the Fed raises interest rates, do you think that's going to have a serious negative impact on the market? I think it, it will have an, a negative impact for a short period of time. But historically, once rates start to rise, the initial move down is normally because the economy is doing better and the, and the stock market normally recovers and does better for a period of time after that. The market today is not already, or I should say the prospect of rising interest rates is not already baked into the market today? It very well could be, but obviously with the way the market's acting today and you're seeing deterioration under the surface um, by, by, uh, by the different equities, the advanced decline line is deteriorating. And so, you know, potentially you could have a little bit of disruption as rates start to rise. But if, is the, it appears to us that the Fed is not going to is going to raise uh, more slowly than they have in the past, mm -hmm. and the economy is really going to have to pick up, which should be positive for earnings.